So the presentation here is going to be a little different from what we just heard. Uh, we're not going to talk about um, science itself. We're going to talk more of a challenge. So you medical students, you go back to Brazil. I'll give you a position at the largest ophthalmology service in the country. And your job is to treat ocular cancer. Okay. So that's the challenge. Every, everybody wants to be an entrepreneur nowadays, so that's your challenge. Uh, first of all, I have no conflict of uh, interest in anything I'm going to present here. So our first challenge back in 2013 was the location of our ocular oncology centers. One might think that the ocular oncologists want to live by the sea, right? As you see, these are the locations of the ocular oncology centers. And you see that the north of Brazil, uh, we didn't have any um, service to see uninsured patients. Um, so we thought about putting an ocular oncology center in the middle of the Amazon forest to try to see these patients early and reduce the burden of travel. So with the help of Champolimau Foundation, and that's a very nice story. Our ex-president was a member of the board in Champolimo Foundation, Mr. Fernando Henrique Cardoso. And he helped uh, to get support from the foundation. As you all know, uh, Mr. Antonio Champolimo had ophthalmology, oncology and Brazil as part of his history. So even before the foundation was born, I think that was already part of your DNA. So we were very grateful and we got support from Champolimau Foundation uh, to establish the center. Human resources would be deployed from Sao Paulo and also locally from Manaus. Patients would be seen weekly and would fly a doctor from Sao Paulo every four to eight weeks to deal with the more complex cases. So this is just a slide back in November 2013 when we had um, the center started. And I'd like to name some people that were fundamental for this project. Of course, Dr. Leonor Beleza, she's been a very good friend of Brazil. And my dad is a big fan of yours since we're talking about family relations here. We also had Dr. Murta, Dr. Rao uh, attending. Professor Cunha Vaz was fundamental for this to happen. And I'm going to briefly present the results of this first step. So in the first year, we had 72 patients. Um, much more difficult than taking a picture during the inauguration was to actually get ocular uh, oncology patients to the clinic. As you know, this is a very rare disease. So although we did go to the radio stations and the TV networks, since it's a rare disease, you need to educate healthcare and the health system to send these patients to you. So if we look only into ocular cancer, we had mostly um, conjunctival disease, which is expected by the geography of the location. Second most common was retinoblastoma and then conjunctival melanoma. And you'd see that diseases that need fundus exam when you dilate the patient's pupil to look inside were more rare. And that could be explained probably because of the health conditions and the difficulty to access a physician and even more difficult to see an ophthalmologist. So most patients still came from the city of Manaus. So that's our center, the big lightning strike there. Uh, but some patients had to travel up to 17 hours by boat. Dr. Leonor, Dr. Rao uh, have been to the Amazon and 17 hours by boat is not easy. That's just to get to Manaus. So there is still a burden of travel, but much less than from Manaus having to go to Sao Paulo uh, and stay there for weeks during treatment with family members. Uh, situation was not ideal, but we did improve uh, care in that sense. I'm sorry about the pictures I'm going to show now, but I just want you to understand the type of patients we would receive. This was our fa first patient that was treated by Luis Fernando Teixeira in Sao Paulo, and he was being treated as congenital glaucoma before being sent to our center. So we were able to take care of all the patients locally, but the retinoblastoma patients that needed a much more complex network to support them. This is a second case. And again, you would see uh, advanced disease on her left eye. And of course, intraocular calcifications you would expect in these lesions. So these were the patients sent to Sao Paulo. The other patients were managed locally by our team 
This is a patient, you see these large exophthalmos on the left, on the right eye, due to HIV and an orbital lymphoma. This is a patient with um, a melanoma, you can see an olive there in the eyelid. And of course, these patients, they see the changes in the mirror and they look for medical attention. And that could be one of the reasons we've seen so, so little uh, choroidal melanomas and fundus lesions. This is a patient that had Kaposi sarcoma and didn't know she was HIV positive or had AIDS and was diagnosed in our center. And just to show the most common disease, this is squamous cell carcinoma. I believe you don't see this in Portugal anymore. Uh, this very extensive uh, disease. Then, of course, at this stage, we have little to offer to these patients. And please feel free to take pictures of my presentation. Actually, if you want a presentation, I'll email it to you. So uh, from our first experience trying to change things, we were able to manage 90% of the patients in Manaus. Center was going well, but then we started running out of fundus. So there's a saying in Brazil that money doesn't solve problems, solutions solve problems. And that's true if you work in a rich institution. If you work in a poor area, little money can change and do a lot. So we had the center working, but we had no way of sending the physician willing to work for free to Manaus. We used some of our miles in the beginning, but then you need to sustain the mini, the, 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 the project. You know, you need to get a doctor there every four months. So we did a crowdfunding for um, old people like me. A crowdfunding is a way to donate money online and you get a reward in exchange for your good action. So again, we had our ex-president, Fernando Ricardo, an amazing guy. Uh, he donated one of uh, each of his 17 uh, books published and was willing to do a manually in script note to the one getting that book. And we had entrepreneurs, design artists, store owners, chefs willing to give stuff in exchange for that donation to the center. And that was pretty cool. Uh, we got $35,000 and that money has been used for the past years to keep the physicians going to Manaus. Of course, they work for free. We pay the air ticket and the hotel and they go every four um, to eight weeks to see the more complex cases. Uh, a second, uh, I'm sorry, a third initiative we did, and that's very specific for Brazil, but we have a law that allows huge companies, those that profit more than 100 million a year, to donate a little bit to taxes they own to the state to pre-approved ocular, uh, ocular, uh, sorry, oncology projects. And ours was the first ocular oncology uh, project to use that law. And I'm, I'm mentioning it here because sometimes solution for our problems is next door or at the next institution. And this is something that would happen in Brazil we were able to get a fortune, $310,000 for us is a fortune. And that has been allowing us to work and see these patients in Sao Paulo, where we see about 570 new cases every year, just using this money, thanks to health cuts in Brazil. So moving to more exciting things, I'm going to talk to you about the Oncophone. So the Oncophone was created for another reason. Uh, we do not believe that every single ocular oncology patient needs to be seen by a specialist. That could be, the, could be true in, in Canada, but shouldn't be true in Brazil. We think uh, an ophthalmologist is probably able to handle the less complex cases, and sometimes he just needs help establishing the diagnosis and the right direction to move. So that's why we've created the Oncophone. It's very non-HIPAA compliant. Patient would just send us a WhatsApp message with a few lines of history and a picture, and we would send back the diagnosis and how to help. And of course, the more complex cases would be sent to us. So this is how it works. Um, you see messages from different area codes and a picture of the patient. Again, this would never happen in North America or in Europe, but thank God we're in Brazil. And we're able to direct care and solve many of these problems without the need for travel, traveling to a, 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 a central a tertiary center for um, helping in the diagnosis. And you see these doctors, they are able to give us decent imaging with very uh, not sophisticated methods. 
and wait for it, Dr. Hugo. Um, see, we're pretty confident someone said Sherpy. That's it. So we're, we know this is not an ocular melanoma, and we can say you, you don't need to send this patient to Sao Paulo. So the Oncophone has been very active and costs zero, and I believe it's been helping uh, many patients. But again, going back to treatment, we also have problems in the health system. For an example, we don't have brachytherapy available for patients that doesn't have insurance. So we've been trying to deal with these problems. I'm sure you all have seen our primary intersection paper. I know most of you have intense feelings about it, but bottom line was to prevent unnecessary enucleations. Primary intersection, uh, the Damato group has shown uh, our data is just newer and more condensed in a uh, newer uh, moment in history. Uh, we got 100% local control, 100% pathology confirmation. We've avoided nucleation in all cases. 0% intraocular complications like uncontrollable uh, bleeding during resection and 0% recurrence in five years. But we did lose vision faster than brachytherapy, which remains the gold standard. So for you medical students, the black spot is the melanoma. This is the optic nerve, and he's, here is the macula where we see. And this is patient right after endoresection. And this patient is our best result. She's 20, 60, almost 60 years, uh, I'm sorry, almost six years after the primary endoresection. So it's pretty good. It's been published. You can see all the details uh, in the publication at the International Journal of, Vitreous, uh, of Retina and Vitreous. Another project more recent is that we've, we've been trying to address the lack of OR time. And for papillomas and squamous cell carcinomas, um, you need you usually have to take the patient in for a resection. So we've done a laser to try to treat these patients, and it was 100% effective in papillomas, 100% effective in reducing the size and pigmentation of conjunctival nevi. Unfortunately, for carcinomas of the conjunctiva, it wasn't that good, 67% control. But you see here, the papillomas respond nicely. And the nevi reduce pigmentation and size. And this boy was happy enough, probably after lasering him um, a few weeks, everybody's going to be happy enough not to, to get more laser. But he said the spot didn't annoy him anymore. This is a carcinoma, and the diagnosis were confirmed by cytology. It would make no sense to operate these patients to get a confirmation. And after five weeks, you see the tumor is gone. And these patients have not presented any recurrence. Um, we've published this recently. It's been published for two months at the ocular surface. You can see uh, all the results there. And again, you have to look to the other room. You say, well, Rubens, you, you, you're saying you don't have money, but the laser is very expensive. It is, but all the retina people have lasers because of diabetic retinopathy. And we can use their laser to laser our patients. So again, that could be a way of saving costs. So, moving to newer stuff, we did. Um, we have the Oncophone, and now we have the Onco YouTube. So we tell the the guys on Oncophone how to treat the patients, but it's a lot of work to tell each uh, doctor uh, send you the information, a complete lesson on how to treat a conjunctival melanoma. So what we did was to create canceroculard.com.br. It's free. You can look in there and very cool videos. And we did a version for ophthalmologists and a second version for patients and their families on the same subject. So it's 33 videos online. You can go in, see about the disease, see how to treat your patients. And you can also show the patient's version um, to the patient and his family to kind of support your way of handling the case. And we've had uh, more than 57,000 views uh, since we've published this online. And last, but probably the most important part, is the team we have working with us. So our doctors are volunteer. They get no money. And if I ask you to come um, to our clinic, Dr. Kuplan, um, would you come to Brazil and see patients? Um, yeah, of course. Maybe for one or two weeks. The problem is to keep these people working for free for months and years. I'm sure Dr. Beleza knows what I'm talking about. So people do it for passion, but they also, also want money. So the challenge here is to build 
an atmosphere where people are willing to go there every week and donate one, one morning a week, every week, is a lot. And the university nowadays doesn't pay for the parking spot. They don't give you black coffee anymore. So you really you work, you pay to go there and see patients that can't afford it. So this is our ocular oncology team. We train four fellows every year. They go back home and the ones willing to stay are always welcome. And then we try to build an atmosphere where people want to be there. They want to be part of our work. They feel they are important. We let them talk in meetings. We let them show they're in charge of what's going on at the university. We empower them. And that's really important to have all these physicians working for free. This very particular case, this doctor comes once a month. He drives four hours to Sao Paulo sees patients the four uh, hours in the morning and then drives four hours back to his hometown. But he's been doing this for four years. And that's really, really impressive. That shows the importance of building a team. And of course, we could not do this without our international teachers and advisors. I'm, I've been telling you about um, difficulties on treating these patients, but we still get those horrible hard cases where we email doctors and ask for advice. This was our last invited professor, Dr. Singh. He'll be here in the afternoon. And we do this a lot with the Shields, Dr. Eagle, Dr. Gombos. And so we not only have help from doctors working for free in Brazil, but we also get you guys working for free uh, for us from your country and helping us to deliver the best care to our patients. So. You're going to learn a lot about genome and new ways of treating patients based on biopsies of nevi. I just wanted to bring to you another scenario of uh, challenges we face when we treat ocular oncology patients, especially in places where sometimes money is available but is not well spent. So I hope this was helpful. And again, thank you so much for the invitation.